Okay, we'll go ahead and get started for our weekly Bible study, December 3rd, 2006. And uh, as like we usually do, I'm going to a few uh, current events. I was on a pretty big debate this week uh, on the internet with some emails. I like to every year send out around the Christmas time, around Easter, around, uh, I should say Christmas, I call it Xmas, Xmas, I like that better, because as we're going to see what what, um, what that word means, uh, you know, around Halloween, I like to get Christians out of their comfort zone, and if they're going to be on my email list, I'm going to constantly strive to do that, yes? Well, we're going to talk about that, you're right, yeah, you're right. Well, we're going to talk about that. Um, and I, I had a lot of people that were all added onto my email list. Well, not a lot. Two in particular that were added onto my email list in the past year that were really taken back by these Xmas emails. And um, um, I'm not going to mention any names in specific, and you wouldn't know them who they were, but um, one is a local man that uh, goes to a local church here that we used to attend, and another lady, is, I met her on tour when I did that Prophecy Club tour, and uh, they were they were coming back to me with all sorts of reasons on, oh, it's okay to celebrate Christmas, and the one guy said to me, uh, you know, this is not up to par of your normal emails, You, you this really isn't up to your normal standards, and... All I got, all I've gotten all week about this particular subject is opinion. That's all I can get. I can't get one scripture out of any of these people. Not one. And I, I'm like, I, you know what it is? I, I finally said, um, I finally said here, I said, this is my, I don't know how many times I responded to this lady. I said, dear reader, again, I'm posting my response to another email regarding Xmas. My response is below in the first email. In essence, what I'm continually hearing is, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind is made up. That's all I'm getting. It doesn't matter how much factual evidence you put in front of them, their mind's made up. They're going to have it their way, they're going to celebrate this holiday, nobody's going to tell them any different, and they're going to find some way to justify it. And none of it's biblical. And all I'm, all I'm trying to do is point this out to them. I personally don't think that either of these people really read the emails I put out. I think they got a couple paragraphs into it, and I think it started getting under their skin a little too much, so then they just wrote me the response based on that anger. But the Bible says that it is a folly and a shame you know, to judge a matter before you hear it. In Proverbs 18, 13, Whoso judgeth a matter before he heareth it is a folly and a shame unto him. So... What I get a lot is a lot of judging a matter before they've heard it out. And then I get a lot of, well, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The, all of it is, is they're trusting in their heart. And the Bible says, he who trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Proverbs 28, 26. And the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. So, that's really all I'm getting with, with this Christmas thing. I'm, I'm giving no biblical... I mean, if somebody could come to me and say, oh, no, brother, you're wrong. You know, actually... Um, but the evidence is so unbelievably overwhelming. Now, I've got, I don't know how many preachers on my email list, but not one of them refuted any of this. In fact, I didn't get in any, any debate with any of the preachers. Now, that doesn't mean that a lot of the preachers aren't in agreement with me, but I just wonder what's going on in their churches. Are they just, are, maybe they're silently in agreement with me, but, oh man, I never buttoned my collars this morning. I'm sorry. Um, but, um, they may be in silent agreement with me, but are they implementing it in their church? I mean, then, you know, that's that's worse almost. In God's eyes, I mean, there, there's some preachers out there that they went to their cemeteries, they never were taught any different. They've never, maybe, maybe they've never heard this, I don't know. i got to believe that pretty much everybody's heard this at one time or another. Why didn't they look into it more? I mean, you got to understand, if, if the world is doing it, and if the world is embracing it, and if the world is loving any particular holiday, well then, whoa, 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 we got to look, look at that extra close. Because anything the world loves, and we're doing it alongside the world, the Bible says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Well, you are unequally yoked together when you're celebrating this holiday. In fact, many Christians will have common ground with their worldly families, of course, the Christians are as worldly as the families anymore. 
Um, and I say Christians loosely, because if you're a true Christian, then you're a follower of Christ. But people don't do that. Um, it would probably be better just to say Bible believer. Actually, and if you really want to get specific, say King James Bible believer. <laughs> because the Bible anymore is anything goes. We, you got literally hundreds of translations um, of, the, uh, of the Bible. And really all they are is perversions. They're, they're not a version, they're a perversion of the Word of God. Because there can only be one Word of God. There's not, God's not up in heaven where the Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, which is what the Bible says. Okay, so if it's forever settled in heaven, there's one Bible up in heaven. There's not 116 versions. You know, they don't wait for Zonderfan to come out with their newest version every month. And you know, Zonderfan, which produces many of these perversions, um, is owned by HarperCollins. HarperCollins is the one that prints the Satanic Bible. Same? Well, that's a, that's not a good... That, that's kind of like, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Not only they prevent it printing a perverted Bible, but the company that's pr printing it is perverted. So, um, you know, it's all about money, and, and um, the devil loves it. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. The, the world is going to be judged out of, uh, out, of the, out, of the, out of the Word of God, which is the King James Bible. Um, and it's the only it's the only version too that doesn't have a copyright on it because all these other versions have copyrights because that's why they part part of the reason why they came out uh, probably the main reason is because every time they come out with a new version people flock to the bookstores they they could get their newest perversion on the Bible their newest opinion because see every time a new Bible comes out it has a little different opinion of what this verse says and what that verse says and that makes it easier for somebody to look into those Bibles and say, well, my opinion is, I mean, that Bible's opinion is this, this Bible's opinion on this verse. Is, sometimes they take out whole verses. That's really getting opinionated when you remove a whole verse out of the Bible. Um, so it, it's, it's just a, it's a mess out there. Um, this lady wrote me, and she said to me, uh, now, this is after I already responded to her two or three times already, okay? And she said, um, now, this woman, uh, she goes to church up north, and uh, she goes to a per perverted uh, apostasy-laden church, as far as I can tell, because every time I get in a conversation with her, um, she has a pretty good comprehension on a lot of these issues we talk about on a week-to-week -week basis, and for the most part, she's in agreement, but the church she goes to isn't. And her preacher, she says, I've tried to give all this stuff to my pastor, and, and he doesn't receive any of it. And I said, like, well, why don't you get out, then? Get out of there! What are you doing there? I said, if you're if you're more knowledgeable than your pastor, and you have higher standards, and in in in, in your, he's at a lower level than you. How could you go to this church? How could you hang around? I don't understand it. Well, I don't know. I guess she goes for the fellowship or something. I I, I don't know. I don't see any biblical precedent for it. Um, but. She says, my friend, here's how she starts out. Now, I don't know if this is her pastor or whether she's got friends that are other. But she says, subject. Here's the subject of the email. My friend, who is a minister, wrote back to me about celebrating Christmas. This is what her friend... Now, I wrote... See, because I've forwarded all these emails. And every time I get an email that s tries to say this or that, what I do is I send out another email that rebuts that email. And I, do, I get stronger and stronger. And what I try to do... When it comes to an issue like this, doctrinally, which is so obvious, is I really try to put them in a corner. I really try to do it because the evidence is so overwhelming. It's easy for me. It's not so much me. It's the evidence that's putting them in a corner. It's not because I want to be right or, oh, look at me. I'm Mr. Smarty Pants Theologian Guy. I'm not any of that. Um, I didn't go to a cemetery. I mean, seminary, sorry. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't have the advantage of any of that. I didn't get saved until I was 24. I came out of the most worldly background you could come out. I didn't have the advantage these other people had. Many of them growing up in a Christian household, uh, maybe having their dads be preachers, maybe going to uh, church three times a week. I didn't have any of that. So I don't understand. If I didn't have any of that as an option, why are they in this position where they've had maybe... Two to three to four to five to six to seven times more time than I've had to, to search these things out, to see if they were true or not. The Bible says that about the Bereans. It says they were more noble than those in Thess Thessalonica. Why? Because they sought those things out which were put before them. 
They sought them out. That's what we're supposed to be. And we've got to be that way today because the Bible says if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. So we've, if there was ever a time in the, in the history of the planet when a Christian, when a Bible-believing King James Christian would need to be more noble, would need to be searching those things out, seeing if they were true, why? Because if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. If there were ever a time to do that, now's the time to do it. You don't want to just sit back and, 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 and accept whatever's being thrown at you because most of what you're going to get in, a, in, a, in your average typical church is going to be heresy. And they could preach, even if they're preaching 95% truth in a given sermon, it's that 5%. That's all rat poison is. It's 95 or 98% good food and 2 to 3% poison. That's all it takes. That's why the Bible says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Leaven's always a type of sin. And it's the truth with doctrine. And actually, when Jesus was talking to the disciples, they asked him at one time, they said, what, what is this leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? He said, it's basically the doctrine. It's the doctrine of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What was that? Well, they had added to the word of God, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, in a big time way. And they had, they had made all these new different things where nobody could ever keep any of it. They had elevated themselves up to this lofty standard, and they had totally gotten away from the Bible. So, leaven, in its pure sense, in a biblical sense, is typically meaning doctrine. Okay, and that's how you get away from the Word of God. When either you're ignoring obvious doctrine, or you're embracing false doctrine. So anyway, she says, my friend who is a minister, oh boy, that means so much to me, wrote back to me about celebrating Christmas. Then she says, now this is her statement. Whatever the reason we started celebrating Christmas, whatever the reason, whatever, we are honoring Christ now. End of statement. Well, I stand corrected. She's right, you know. I'm, I'm wrong, and you're right. <laughs> I read this and I, I fell out of my chair. This is after I've already already given her boatloads and boatloads and boatloads of inf information, which is basically irrefutable. I mean, and yet, this is what I get. And then she gives me the response of the minister. You want to hear that one? Oh, okay. Okay, so here's what the minister wrote her. At the beginning of the day, we love our God. The creator of all. And don't do enough to honor his only begotten son. So here's the justification. Here comes the, okay, we're going to do something totally unbiblical. And here's why we're going to do it. Here's the justification from a minister. Because he's a minister. He's got to be smarter than you and I. We're just mere peons. We're just mere pew warmers. He's a minister. He might have went to school. And I didn't. So he knows more than me. At the end of the day, we love our God. Aren't we supposed to love the Lord in spirit and in truth? Hmm. We love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. Okay. In order to do that, don't you have to be doing that in truth? The Bible says, Jesus said, If you continue in my word, then are ye my, my disciples indeed. And then it says, and, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, What's implied in that verse? What's implied in that verse is that if you continue in His Word, if you continue in His Word, the true Word of God, then you're my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. Well, how do you know the truth? Through the Word of God. Okay. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, we love our God. How are we loving our God if we're, if we're walking in absolute apostasy and doctrinal error and ignoring the obvious teachings of the Word of God and, and all of the other obvious things that I'm going to get into here about Christmas. But I'm just the, uh, the nut on the edge of town. I'm just the, the one that, um, you know, oh, he's, he's uh, you know, I've, I've heard this one about me. Um, well, he's, he's a good man. He's just, he's just, he's really radical. He's, he's just off base on a lot of things. He's, he's this and he's that. I'm, I'm sure a lot of nastier things have been said about that than me. That's fine. I really don't care. I truly don't, because my life's not a popularity contest. That doesn't stop me. In fact, it only motivates me more when I hear it. Because I realize they're just saying this because what they're hearing is pricking their own conscience. And they are, and, and like any 
person that wants to hang on to their sin, when they're back in their corner, they're going to lash out in order to justify their sin. What they're going to try to do is when they'll read something like this about Christmas, then the spotlight comes on them. They can't stand that spotlight being on them. So what they've got to do is find the quickest way to get that spotlight off them back on me or anyone else that's putting out truth. It doesn't matter if it's me or whoever. They want to get that spotlight off them on to the other people. Oh, they're just nuts. They're crazy. They're radicals. They're Well, that, again, that's an opinion. Who cares? Everybody's got an opinion. But if your opinion doesn't line up with the Word of God, then your opinion is wrong. Did you have something you want to ask me? Well, yeah, we're going to get into that. Yeah, and I'm sorry if I use the word Christmas, because I don't really like even using that word. I, I don't think it's it's right, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. So, again, he says, at the end of the day, we love our God, the creator of all, and do, I mean, this, is, this sounds like a real true theologian to me, and don't do enough to honor his only begotten son. Yes, Christmas, and now this is continuing here, yes, Christmas has become a commercialized holiday. Okay, so he acknowledges that. It's become a even if even if Christmas were true and valid, even if it was, even if we did find out when Christ was actually born, even if we learned all of that, where does it say in the Bible number one to celebrate it? Where where, where does it give us a, a, a mandate to, to celebrate the birth of Christ? Now, granted, yes, the birth of Christ is a wonderful thing, no doubt about it. But this is the very reason it was never known about because God knew in His infinite wisdom we would turn it into something that He never commanded us to do. We would elevate this day, and we're going to get into that more in this response. So, it says, yeah, Christmas has become a, for, a commercialized holiday, but unfortunately, he says unfortunately, it is part of our culture. Now, hold on, that kind of is a weird statement. Unfortunately, it's, in other words, it's almost as though he's acknowledging it's, it's a bad holiday, and it's unfortunate, but, hey, it's part of our culture, and we're supposed to be equally yoked together with unbelievers. And we're supposed to be, as, you know, as Christ with Belial and unbelievers with believers. We're, that's, can't do anything about it. It's just inevitable. Just accept it. It's unfortunate, but, you know, we as Christians, we're really not called to be salt and light. We're not called to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. We're, that's all passe. That, that's all... That's all old-time biblical doctrine. We, it's too far. We, we're, 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 we're more mature than that now. We can, we glory in our shame now. We, it's okay. We're lukewarm. We, we think we're in need of nothing, but that's all right. That's okay. It, it, it's no big deal. But unfortunately, it's part of our culture. And get this. Now, let me read this whole statement one more time. Yes, Christmas has become a commercialized holiday, but unfortunately it is part of our culture and helps keep the economy going. <laughs> My favorite statement in the whole, boy, he really gets to the chase right there. And help keep, you know something? That is an abomination in the sight of God. This, this, this whole, this is, this is the reason that America is the way it is. We got these strong, we got, we got preachers out there with backbones like Redwoods, you know. They're writing these kind of letters to, to, to me. He didn't, I mean, he didn't even write this to me directly. I got it third, third person from another woman. I'd go against a preacher any day on this. I don't care who, who a preacher there is. Any day, if you want to debate this subject, I'll load their boat. It's not because I'm so smart, it's because the evidence is so overwhelming. This is pagan. This is witchcraft. And I'm going to I'm going to substantiate all that in a synopsis form today. So it says, so it helps keep the economy going. <laughs> well, that, I might as well just sit back. I can't argue that kind of logic. Um, at least it is what's that? Oh, that's exactly what it does. Helps keep the economy going. That's funny because everybody's going out putting all this money in their credit card. And the Bible says the borrower is slave to the lender. So, when you're doing something unbiblical, over and over and over and over and over again, then it's going to have consequences. But, you know something, we can inflate the economy artificially during the Christmas season and everybody thinks we're prosperous. And we go out and buy gifts we can't afford, and do this and we do that, and justify this or that, and, and, and spend all this money where God never commanded us to spend a dime on this pagan holiday. And we're spending all this money, I mean... 
could you imagine if everybody took all their money one year that they would normally spend on Christmas and it all went to things of the Lord? You could turn the world upside down in about one month. You probably, I mean, but that's not going to happen, but it would be, it would be an amazing thing if all that money that was really going to the devil ended up going to the Lord. That would be an amazing, awesome thing. I'd love to see that happen. But I don't think it's ever going to, not in, not in this dispensation. So it says, <clears throat> helps keep the economy going. At least it still has its name, Christmas, in quotes, which helps remind people of its real meaning. This guy's really done his homework. Boy, he's, he's right on the money! Sharp as a tack! And then, I'm, and then I have a comment here. Please see below for the real meaning of this word. We're going to talk about that. And then he says, whatever the folks did a long time ago does not overly concern me. <laughs> so in other words, um, he doesn't care what the foundation of Christmas was. But the Bible says if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Wow. Well, to him, Proverbs 11, verse 3, that foundation verse, that doesn't mean anything because it doesn't really matter how it started out. All it matters is how it ends up. And he looks at it and says, well, we're honoring Christ to a certain degree and, 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 and the pagans are, 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 are in there doing it with us. And you know, hey, we'll take what we can get. We'll take whatever scraps the devil will throw us from his pagan table. Isn't that what we're doing? When, when, when we celebrate this? So it says, um, oh, here we go. Whatever the folks did a long time ago does not overly concern me. We have come a long way. <laughs> I, for one, will celebrate the holidays and continue to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. All the best. We've come a long way. We've come a long way down to the pit of hell. As a nation, as, as, as whatever... So, I wrote her back, and I try to be cordial when I write people back. Oh, yeah, how, how could this guy be saved? How, how could he be saved? I'm sorry. I, don't, I just don't see how it's possible. I really don't. You talk about if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived, and in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies... In hypocrisy, isn't that the most hypocritical thing you ever heard? Having, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Well, his conscience is obviously seared. He could go. He could go and justify one of the highest pagan satanic holidays on the on the occult calendar, and his conscience doesn't even bother him. Wasn't well, that having your conscience seared with a hot iron? He's obviously speaking lies in hypocrisy. Why did that all start? Because he gave heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. He's giving heed to that. This is one of those those uh, teachings. We just had a little discussion here on, on this, how disgusting, disgusted we all are with this. But this is one of those teachings that, where you could say, well, why do I need to know this? Well, the Bible says always to be able to give a hope for the answer that's within you, for the hope that is within you, the hope of glory. Now, granted, that has a direct application to Christianity and in 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 why you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and why you believe. But I think that. We also need to know it from the, from the standpoint of that this has everything, this, this particular holiday, they're trying to bring Christ into this holiday. And we need to know, we need to be able to explain, no, this doesn't have anything to do with Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And why that is, and be able to back ourselves up. Now, they may not believe you, but if you have your facts straight, you, you, have, a, you have an opportunity to go back to them and uh, at least give them the truth you know, about this particular subject. Um, and also, lest we be ignorant of Satan's devices. Now, see, that's probably the main, because most people don't know this, and most people, when they do find this out, it's still not going to change them. But th there's the... Well, I'm going to get into this, because uh, um, I pretty much get into a lot of uh, what I'm going to be talking about here in a second. So, I wrote, I wrote back to her, I said, I respect yours and others' rights to your opinions, but all that is really going to matter is when we as Christians stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. So I just tried to get it right back to our accountability. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether, the, whether to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 
Now, the Bible says some will be saved, yet so is by fire. Now, I'm not saying every single one of these people aren't saved. I think a lot of them aren't. I think the Bible says that narrow is the way that leadeth to life eternal, and few there be that find it. I think that so many are deceived right now, and they're so deceived that they're not even saved. They're not even... Um, but it says, if you do make it to the judgment seat of Christ, which means you're saved, it says we, we're going to have to receive the things done in, their, in our bodies according to that what we have done, whether they be good or bad. Now, this would fall under one of those things where uh, I think Christmas is obviously something we would have done in the body that is an abomination in God's eyes, and this would not be something that we would get a reward, but a punishment more at the judgment seat of Christ, you know. It's called the judgment seat of Christ, not the love seat of Christ, okay? So, <laughs> it, it's, it's, um, we have to look at it from that way, okay? So it says then, it says, I'm always one, I, I, this is me writing, I said, I'm always one to err on the side of safety in regard to matters like Xmas. On the occult calendar, we're going to see below, Xmas is one of the high nights of human sacrifice. So see, I just go right for the, right for the kill, right off the bat, okay? It's one of the high nights of human sacrifice. Oh, how are we going to Christianize that one? Um, and then I... And then I say, also see below the evil origins of, of all every Xmas tradition, which we're going to look at that. The Roman Catholic Church is who brought us this pagan tradition to the Christians, and they are evil. So can we bring forth lasting good fruit, because somebody might say, yes, but I know on Christmas this man got saved or whatever. Okay, but I said, can we bring forth lasting good fruit from an evil foundation? I'm just posing the obvious question. Proverbs 11, verse 3, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Quoting from the article below, we read, Christianity began to be corrupted through the same type of paganism during the reign of Constantine. Now, this, this began around uh, 318, when the Roman Catholic Church actually really came into, a, to, into its existence through Constantine, who was considered like the first pope. Okay? This is when this started. This... This king, Constantine, began the practice of combining Christian doctrine, Christian art, and Christian objects with those of paganism. This process is called syncretization. Okay? Now, why did he want to do this? Because he wanted one big amalgamation of the religions. He wanted the pagans and the Christians to be all on the same page. He could rule over them all with impunity, and he wouldn't have to worry about dealing with all these Christians who were, were, were getting martyred and they were throwing them to the lions and all these things like that. It wasn't working. The, the religion kept growing the more they did it. And he's like, well, okay, let's, let's try this another angle here. The devil's like, we've got to use another approach because the more Christians I kill, the more of them that get converted. So what they try to do is introduce the leaven into Christianity, which is so bad now, you, everywhere you turn it's pure leaven. But this is when it started. Of course, I never, ever, ever will refer to anything that has to do with Roman Catholic roots as Christian. It's not. Because every, every show you watch in regard to this, if, like they do a documentary in the History Channel, well, the early Christians, and they always are referring to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was never Christian, ever. It was pagan from its foundation, it was straight from the pit of hell, and that's all it ever was, and that's all it ever will be. Now, if, if that religion is, is, is destroyed, if its foundations are destroyed, how can it ever bring forth good fruit? The Catholic religion is one of the main, uh, if not the main, tool Satan used to kill martyrs. To, to slaughter millions, basically, of martyrs. Now, I'm not saying every person that the Catholic Church slaughtered were Christians. They, they slaughtered some pagans, too, but it was all wrong. Where, where do we get any biblical mandate in, in this book, in the New Testament, to go out and kill if they don't convert? I mean, I don't see that anywhere. I don't see Jesus doing it. I don't see Jesus wielding a sword, cutting people's heads off, and torturing people to, to try to get them to basically accept Him as their Lord and Savior. I don't see any biblical mandate for that whatsoever. But the Catholics have done it, and trust me, if they get another chance, they'll do it again. They will. Um, so it says, um, while Constantine began this practice, the Roman Catholic Church perfected it. For example, the obelisk, which are those, which is, uh, the, you ever seen the Washington Monument in, in our capital? That's one of the um, most vile pagan symbols on the planet. That's the symbol of a male phallus. 
the male reproductive organ. That's what that's symbolic of. Where do we get that from? Egypt. They used to worship that. Why did they worship that? Because, um, was it... What? study it, and it's, it's to represent the sun god Ra. Yeah, it's to represent the sun god Ra. When, was, it, was it that the sun god Ra, um, uh, Tammuz, um, I believe he was chopped up, and his body parts were sent to different parts of the pro and the one body part they couldn't find was his male organ. And so that was the thing that I believe Semiramis saying up to, to actually worship, because she couldn't find that. So that's why they worship the obelisk. That's where we get that fun tradition from, okay? But you know something? If we try hard enough, we can, we can make that a good thing. Catholic Church believed it was true. If we just try hard enough, we can make that obelisk, that male phallus symbol, that thing that we worship, we could turn it into good. The Bible says, Woe to them that call evil good and good evil. Well, isn't that what Christmas is? Or Xmas? We're calling something evil that's what we're saying it's good. And we're saying that something that's good is evil. Well, what would that be? Well, when I say, when I get up here and proclaim truth about Chris Xmas, and I'm vilified for it, what are you doing to me? and I've got all the facts on my side, biblically overwhelming facts, then you're calling me evil when actually what I'm doing is good. The Bible says one of them called evil good and good evil. Well, you call me evil or anyone else that's putting out truth, it says woe unto them. The Bible also says woe unto them that reward evil for good. And that, a lot of that goes on too. So it says... Um, for example, the obelisk standing in the middle of St. Peter's Basilica, the Catholic Popes, oh thank you, um, the Catholic Popes have falsely believed they could Christianize this satanic symbol of worship by praying over it and anointing it with holy oil, this obelisk. Thus making this object suitable for Christian use. Oh, okay, as long as we have enough people praying over it, it's okay. Now, the picture that I don't have here is a picture of St. Peter's Basilica where it has the big the, the, the two largest obelisks on the planet, one is the Washington Monument, I believe that's the biggest one, and the second one is, um, um, and I believe the, the Washington Monument, if you actually go below ground, if you take it from below ground, where its foundation actually starts at 666 feet high. I don't know if you knew that. Another thing about the Washington Monument, if you look at it, it's got two red eyes. If you ever look at it at night, Two red eyes at the very top. That's where you can go all the way up to. And it looks like two red demon eyes looking out of this. Taylor, what are you doing? Um, yeah. Okay, so getting back... Oh, thank you. G getting back to this. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, 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 the Washington Monument is the largest obelisk on Earth. It's 666 feet high. If you go below ground, uh, I mean, where it actually the foundation is, that's in the ca our capital, 666 feet high. It's got two red... When you, when you look at it at night, it's got two red eyes that come out. I mean, it looks, it looks like a devil. Two red eyes that, that shoot out at night from that thing. And the second largest obelisk is in St. Peter's Basilica, I believe, um, and that's in Rome. Okay, and in St. Peter's Basilica, we have, and I, I have the picture here, but it didn't print out. Um, and this is where the Vatican is. We have a large, round, uh, this, I guess they call it the Basilica, and then we have the obelisk right in the center. Now what that's symbolic of is the female genital organ, the round female opening, and then the obelisk in the center of it. That's what it's symbolic of. That's, that's, and that's the foundation of the Catholic faith. But see, they believe that, that if, as long as they pray and anoint it, the people in the know in the Catholic Church know what it means. But they're just duping the masses. You know, these people that, that, are, that are following this false religion. But no matter what you do like that, you can't make it suitable for Christian use. You can't make something, you can't take the devil and, or, or, or a pig and, and, and put some perfume on it and put some lipstick on it and make it good. You just can't. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Okay, so then it says uh, in this article, it said, For the past 1400 years, the Roman Catholic Church has led Western civilization down this road of syncretization where matters of, of satanic were mixed with matters of Christian. That's what 
the devil's always seeking to do. Now, if you had a really, really strong, Bible-believing, fundamental group of Christians, the devil knows that he's not going to come in there right off the bat and introduce something like some gigantic heresy. People aren't going to buy it. So the devil is content with having any little toehold he can have initially. A lot of people would think, well, the devil couldn't be that patient. He's very patient. All he's got is time until he goes to the lake of fire. Because that's where he's going and his, and his angels. That's what the lake of fire was prepared for. The Bible says it wasn't even prepared for humans. But through Adam's sin, we have that as an option now. Well, um, so the devil is content whenever he has anybody that is, um, that is doctrinally sound, he's content getting any little toehold he can get because he knows, the devil knows, that this little bit of leaven will eventually permeate leaven the whole lump. And let's say the first generation were all really truly saved Bible-believing Christians, but by the time, if they let this leaven come in, by the time the second generation or maybe, maybe even the third generation rolls around, these people are to the point where they're not even saved anymore. They're not even living in it because they let that little leaven come in at the very, very, very beginning let it permeate, and as yeast permeates the loaf of bread, it all starts to get destroyed. That's why the Bible says, Come out from among them, be separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Because when you touch the unclean thing, it will affect you in a spiritual way. And um, the Bible says, For you are the temple of the Lord, which temple are ye? And the temple is holy. Okay, so if you, if you start mingling the temple of the Lord with paganism or with false doctrine, it's going to affect you spiritually. And uh, that's why I do what I do, because I see it happening all around me. I see that I was headlong into it for a long time. God let me go through that, um, so hopefully I could help other people. So, um, it says, um, the, result of, the result of all this is where satanic things are mixed with Christian. The result is a putrid mess that Jesus Christ will always reject. Too many people will, will awaken themselves... At the, at the white, great white throne judgment, realizing too late that Jesus did not approve one iota of this mingling of paganism and true Christianity. Well, let's go back to Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 11, and Jeremiah 14, where it says that where it got so bad that God said, don't even pray for this people, I won't hear your prayer anymore. Well, why was that? Well, part of that says they were baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven. And what is the Queen of Heaven? The Queen of Heaven is this Mary worship. The Queen of Heaven is, is when you have this idol before you that you're actually worshiping. And that they said the whole family were baking cakes. The, the, the children were gathering the wood and all these other things. So the whole family was participating in this. So that was paganism. Well, this is no different. Now, I'm not saying that every single person that celebrates Christian who is a Christian is going to hell. I'm not going to say that. Because I think a lot of them generally don't know this. But it's a really risky proposition to be in. It's really risky doing that. I mean, don't you want to err on the side of safety? I mean, wouldn't that be prudent? The Bible says, above all, seek it prudence and understanding and wisdom and knowledge and the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, this is the truth. Well, what does the truth do? Well, if you embrace truth, it'll set you free. But if you reject truth, then the conscience starts to get seared. See, there's a really big consequence to rejecting truth, and I'm going to talk about that in a second here. Really big consequence. December 25th is known as the Nativity of the Sun. Now, this is in the, the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Nativity of the Sun. Did you ever know that? Did you ever know that December 25th was called the Nativity of the Sun? S-U-N, Sun. Okay? This date is also the birth date of Tammuz. Tammuz was the... Um, was the byproduct of Semiramis. Um, Nimrod ended up dying. She had a son. Did Nimrod impregnate? Was that was that Nimrod's son, or, or did she get impregnated after Nimrod died? I'm trying. I'm trying to remember. I, I think it is. I think it's Nimrod's son, and she ended up marrying Tammuz. Okay, which is like how how perverted and twisted is that? I mean, you marry your own son that you bore. Whoa! This is the birth date of Tammuz, December 25th. The pagan equivalent of the sun god, the son of God. The pagan equivalent of the son of God. This is where we get Mary holding the baby in the Catholic Church. 
where did that all start? That started back in ancient Babylon at the Tower of Babel where you had Semiramis and Tammuz, Semiramis holding Tammuz, and they worshipped that. That's where we get all this. Yeah. We were just talking about the from antiquity, they've had these same carvings of a, you know, the mother figure holding the baby child, and that's been worshipped all through, starting in Babylon, all through, almost every pagan religion has this at some part, and usually at a very, very high part of their religion, they worship this mother-child figure. Um, now, again, we're not ever supposed to, to bow down to idols and worship them, period. The Bible's very clear about that, okay? But, you know, they just ignore this stuff, it's just ignored. So, Tammuz is the pagan equivalent of the Son of God. Also known as the reincarnation of the sun god, S U N God. Okay, Tammuz. Traditionally, December 21st is also known as Yule. But the Roman Catholic Church moved the celebration of Yule to December 25th. Okay, probably maybe to distance themselves just a little bit from the 21st. Okay. And again, when the Roman Catholic Church was starting to do all this through Constantine and, and you know, the, the, uh, the uh, 300s and the, and the 400s, they had to be smart about this. They weren't going to just just basically say, okay, Christians, you're going to celebrate the pagan holidays and you're going to like it. They couldn't do that. The, the Christians wouldn't buy it. And I mean, I kind of use the term Christians loosely because those people really knew better. If they went into this, they really did know better. A lot of people today don't know better. That doesn't give them an excuse because they still have the same access to the Internet or if they really want to know the truth, they can get up there and find out if they want to. But they really, they were coming from a position of truth to error. Anymore, if you're born in this world that we live in today, you're just already in error. You're just already in error. I mean, unless you seek the truth, you're not going to know it. So they knew better. So... December 21st is also known to the Romans as Saturnalia. We, heard, we hear the planet, planet Saturn, okay? Saturn, which is also a derivative of the, of the name Satan, okay? Saturn is one of the ancient Greek gods in the pantheon that was worshipped, okay? Saturn has six letters. Saturn is the sixth planet from the sun. Six, six, Saturn, Satan. Okay, see, Satan has a lot of different ways you can pronounce his name. He just, there's just not one way you can spell it S A T E N. You can sell it. You can spell it S A T O N. Satan. That's another way they say it in pagan ceremonies. Saturn is another way you can say it. So see, that's a lot of a lot of times when you see in the occult they'll change letters, just because it kind of hides the true meaning. Say Santa. Claus, Santa, Satan, Claus. There, there's a lot of there's. We can get down that one too. We're, we're going to look at that real quick. Well, we were we were just talking. We had another little discussion, and um, that Tertullian came out with a with a paper on this very subject. That when the early Christians started celebrating, he did not refer to it as Christmas. He referred to it as Saturnalia which is really the proper name of what the modern day quote Christmas should be. It should be called Saturnalia. It's really more accurate. Um, what was Saturnalia? It was a time of deliberate debauchery of every sort. You know, and um, pagan holiday. And that's all it was. Um, drinking through repeated toasting, known as the wasal, was a key to the debauchery of this particular celebration. Fornication was symbolized by the mistletoe. And the entire event was finished with a great feast or Xmas dinner. And that's just a little bit about that. I can't really get too far into any one particular thing or we wouldn't have time to, to get very far today. Even the name Christmas is pagan and blasphemous. Christi meaning Christ, while Mass means Mass. Okay, now, you've heard of the Catholics go to their Mass... Okay, well, since all pagan masses are commemorating death, that's what a mass is, it's commemorating the death of like some fallen saint or whatever. A mass commemorates death. The name Chris Mass literally means the death of Christ. Did you ever know that? Now, we're taught it means the birth of Christ. But 
hold on, Christmas, the actual word itself, basically means the death of Christ. Why would they want to do that? We're not told that. We're told it was the birth of baby Jesus. Well, that's a lie, too. There's no way it could have been in that time frame. From, from all the people that I've ever seen, in, in the biblical accounts, the way that they had put it, it had to be sometime in early October or late September, most likely was when Christ was born. When that date exactly was, we don't know. We're not going to know until we get into heaven. If we get there, I mean, I don't know. I mean to say that by, by not doubting my particular salvation, but um, as a Christian, most of the Christians out there are deceived. They're deceived. And they think they're going to heaven, and they're not. Because the Bible says, narrow is the way that leads to life eternal, and few there be that find it. And, I, and we know that this is the time that the Bible talks about in Revelation, whether it's going to be a lukewarm, and that they're lukewarm Christians, and that they're neither hot nor cold, and they think they're in need of nothing, yet they're blind, wretched, weak, naked. And so, most people are under the false assumption right now that they're going to heaven. And they're not. And, you know, you could say, well, you're just judging me and you think you're better. No, I don't. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I, I don't think that I'm better. So, it, the Bible says, or this word Christmas literally means the death of Christ. A deeper meaning lies in the mention of, of Christ without specifying Jesus. Thus, the Antichrist is in view here. The, pelag the pagans celebrate Christmas as a celebration of their coming Antichrist. See, the, the, the pagans celebrate it for the right reasons. We're celebrating it for the wrong reason. They're celebrating it for, for, what, the, what, for what the holiday really is. Which is a celebration of the coming Antichrist. A celebration of the birth of the sun god, Tammuz. Who was really the first, one of the first deities ever worshipped. The Antichrist who will deal a death blow to the Jesus Christ of Christianity. So it's actually the exact opposite of what we're assuming that it means to be. Oh, but it doesn't matter. As long as we celebrate it for Christ, that makes it okay. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It does not make it okay. You can't take something evil and make it good just because your opinion says it's good. That doesn't matter. Early American Christian pilgrims refused to celebrate this day. I mean, you could go back and look at the, at the early church. They never celebrated it. And that was what we're going to talk about next. Christmas was not among the earliest festivals of the church. It was not celebrated, commemorated, or observed, neither by the apostles nor the apostolic church, for at least the first 300 years of the church history. Oh, well, then all of a sudden, did it just become okay? Evidently. History reveals that around 440 A.D., the church at Jerusalem commenced the celebration of Christmas following the lead of Roman Catholicism. Well, again, that's where we get this whole junk from. Also, there is no biblical warrant, precedent, nor precept for remembrance of, a day, of the day of Christ's birth as a day of special religious celebration. There's nothing in the Bible that says for us to do this. Even if we did know Christ's birth, there's nothing in the Bible saying we need to do all this. This is not to say that we shouldn't remember Christ's birth and its significance. But, for religious commemorations or celebrations, we must have some kind of biblical command or precedent. It is very important to be able to scripturally justify all things that we do. Many believers say we have liberty in these matters as Christians. We, we have liberty. Okay? Well, in reference to that scripture, and I'm going to quote that scripture here, we need to look at the whole verse, which is typically what's not happening with most of this stuff. Galatians 5.13 For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only, use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but to serve one another. So we'll, they'll say, well the Bible says we've been called unto liberty. We have liberty in these matters. But the Bible says also, use, only use not this liberty that you have for an occasion of the flesh. That's what Christmas is. You're using the liberty that you have for an occasion of the flesh. Because it feels right. Um, but love, but by love serve one another. So, so by love serve one another. Well, when I present this to somebody, the Bible says, am I, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4.16 Do I love you enough to tell you the truth? Well, you don't, most people don't view it that way. Most people view it like, 
They don't view it that somebody would do this out of love. They would view it as, you're stepping on my toes and I don't like you because you're giving me the truth and I don't like the truth. I don't want to be set free. That's what they're saying because the Bible says the truth is what sets you free, particularly the truth of the Word of God. So when they come to you and they get mad at you and they get offended about this type of material, they're basically saying, I don't want the truth. It's offensive to me. Get it away from me. That's dangerous. Real dangerous. I'm going to talk why that's dangerous in a second here. The fact of the matter is this. The early church did not celebrate Christ's birth. Now, don't you think the early church, of all churches, who, especially the apostles who followed Jesus for those years, and then maintained, um, and then went out and preached to the world after he had went to be on the right hand of God the Father, don't you think they would have a pretty good... Uh, idea of what we should do and what we shouldn't, seeing they actually lived with Jesus Christ here in this earth, and yet the, the early church did nothing of the sort. They never celebrated this holiday in any way, shape, or form. I think they'd have a better idea about this than we would. So, the early church did not celebrate Christ's birth, but such celebration only came into the church with the Christianization of pagan rites as the Catholicism was made the state religion by Constantine in the 4th century. Do you hear that state religion? It's no different today. Take your 501c3 status. What do you become? You become an entity of the state. You are a corporation if you take that. You're a corporation. What is a corporation? A corporation is, is an entity created by the state for the state's use that has a CEO called the pastor and a board of directors called the deacons. And if you don't do that in, in, your, in your minutes and in, in all your, your paperwork, because you have to have paperwork to do all this, they'll, they'll create them for you. They will, if, if you go to court and you get called on the carpet, Dr. Dixon found this out, they'll actually create board of, of directors and deacons for you based on what they think they should be. That's why it's so dangerous to take that status. The state religion is how this came into being. The Christianization of pagan rites as Catholicism was made. The state religion by Constantine. It's no different today. When you take that status, when you, when you get into that 501c3, and it's very, very, very hard to do, to not do it. This is one of the only safe ways to do it, is to meet in small groups like this. When you do that, you are letting that leaven of the state religion permeate through what you're going to do. And even if you think you're a strong, Bible-believing, on-fire church, that's going to affect you, eventually. It will affect you in a negative way. Well, how do you know that? Just look around at all the churches. Look around at all the 501c3 corporations and tell me one of them that's doing it right anymore. I don't know one! I don't. I don't know one mainstream religion right now that has the big picture in view. They may have pieces of the big picture, but they don't have the big picture. Does that mean I think I've got everything figured out? To, no, but I think I've got it figured out better than about any other religion that I've, or, or, or any other 501c3 corporation in existence. Most of them, what happens is, is when you take that status, what is that? That's compromise. So they're compromising. When you compromise, what is that? That is sin. What is leaven? It is sin. When you compromise on one point, what happens is that starts to permeate. And through the fear of man, that leaven's permeating. Fear of man. I took that 501c3 for the fear of man because I wanted to, to be able to placate my congregation so they could write this off on their taxes. Hmm. To appease the IRS. Now, should that be your motivation for tithing? So you can write it off on your IRS taxes? I don't think so. The Bible says that when you give, let not your right hand know what your left hand is doing. That's how you get a reward. You do it in another way, so you're seen of all men. You, your reward, verily, Jesus said, you have your reward. So, um, you see how this is all tied together here. Okay, so we don't want to we don't want to get into that. That's why I'm so dogmatic about these whole points about the 501c3 church, because you see where it leads you. And when you and when you compromise and take that status. And you let that sin start to permeate, and it's compromise, and it's fear of man, fear of the government, whatever you want to call it, you're going to start doing all kinds of things in your church eventually where you're going to further 
compromise. Because the devil is a cruel taskmaster. He's going he's gonna to basically keep whipping you or moving you to a level where you're forced to either come out of that thing or stay in it, play along with the rules, and keep going into it. And pretty soon it's like a frog that's been put, that's been put in lukewarm water and they turn that water up real slow so let's at a rolling boil and that frog's dead, which is what the state of the modern day church is. You could write Ichabod over the doors of basically every church. They're dead, yet they don't even know it. They think they're in need of nothing. And really, you would look at most of these churches and think they are in need of nothing. Well, look at what this big ministry we've built. We've got all this money. We've got all these programs. We've got all this. this and they think that it's God blessing them. The devil said to, to, uh, to Satan, or, or to uh, Jesus Christ, he said, just bow down and worship me and I will give you all these kingdoms. Well, he obviously had that power and he could give it to whomever he will. If the devil can get you to go to hell in a church as a lukewarm Christian, that's fine with him. He don't care as long as he gets you there. That's his goal, to get you to hell. So, we go on and it says that... Um, <clears throat> Since the word of God does not support the tradition of Christmas, a Christian's conscience ought not and must not be bound. Galatians 4, 9-11 says, But now, after that ye have known God, or are rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? Now that's what we're talking about here. Christmas would be considered a weak and beggarly element. Why? How do I know that's true? Because then we look at the next part of the verse, which defines that. Whereunto you... Whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. So these weak and beggarly elements bring you into bondage. Yet most of the time you don't even know you're in bondage. Well, what are they? Well, it says it right here. It says, ye observe days. The Bible says basically to put not one day above another. But it says here, it says ye observe days. Oh, the Messianic Jews don't like that one. Oh, we can't celebrate Purim and... Um, all these Tammuz, don't they have one called Tammuz or something? I don't know. They, they've got all these. They've got all these, these feasts. And now some of them were Old Testament biblical, like the Passover things like that. But um, I don't see any biblical precedence for a Gentile to be bound to celebrating Old Testament Jewish feasts. The Bible says here that the weak and beggarly elements, which bring you into bondage, the first thing they said is, "You observe days." That's why I got it in bold red here. Days. Well, what does that mean? You observe days. Well, you observe a day. You set it above another. Wouldn't that be Christmas? Wouldn't that be Easter? You're observing a day. And months, and times, and years. Why is this dangerous? Well, because this is what the occultists do. They do everything by the calendar. Everything by the stars. The stars have to be in the right alignment. They do everything by number. They're very, very, very superstitious people. That's how Satan is. He, he will whip you and drive you and, and get you in all this false religion. So you observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. I mean, Paul's basically saying here, you know, all this effort that I've devoted to this church of Galatia, is all of it been in vain? And what was the crux of it? The crux of it were that they were observing days and months and times and years. And this leaven was permeating into, into their being. And it was affecting them in an adverse way. So, do you think it's any better today? It's way worse. So, if we willfully reject truth, it can have grievous consequences. How do we know this? Well, because Hosea 4, 6 and 7 says, My people, my people, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So, it doesn't say the devil's people. It says, my people. That would be in reference to, I would believe, a Bible-believing Christian in today's day and age. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The, the, and they'll say... Well, no, that, that can't be because I just I love Christ and I'm saved and all this other stuff. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. What's the consequence? Well, it says then, because thou hast rejected knowledge, which is what I think we're going over today, pretty important knowledge, because you've rejected knowledge. You, in fact, you're the one that rejected it. You rejected it. The, the responsibility is personal in this regard. They've done it. 
because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, this is God talking, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Now, in, in, in New Testament times, Jesus Christ, in the New Testament, refers, um, the Bible refers to us as kings and priests, as a Christian. It says we're joint heirs with Christ, seated with Christ in heavenly places, if we're really saved, born again Christian. Okay. Thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. Now, we, we could just say the word of God at this point. The law and the word are, the law is part of the word. Okay? See, now it's forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. So now, you're not only affecting yourself, or potentially condemning yourself to hell, you're potentially condemning your children to hell. I will also forget thy children? Whoa, this is really serious implications here. I mean, we're talking about something that, that a lot of people say, oh, well, you know. They, that, that guy over there, he's, He's straining at gnats and swallowing camels. He's, he's, he's majoring on the minors and minoring on the majors. This isn't that important. Yes, it is important. It's very important. This is the, one of the most blasphemous. At least Halloween is celebrated as the saint's birthday, pretty much. I mean, granted, I know the Christian church tried to Christianize it with all saints and all this other junk. But, this one to me is the, well, this one and Ishtar are really the two most blasphemous, as far as I can see, because they directly attack and pervert the gospel of Christ. That's why I get so offended by them. So, there's a lot of really serious, dire consequences when you reject knowledge. Now, if I'm wrong, then you know what the preacher's responsibilities are? If they believe I'm wrong, like the ones that are on my email list, if they believe I'm wrong, now if they, if they agree with me, then, then they don't have this responsibility also, but what they should be is up there rebuking me. They should be straightening this guy out. In fact, I would want them to do that for me. I really would. If I was leading anybody astray, I would much rather have them rebuke me. Although, of course, I think you're supposed to do that at least initially in love. The Bible says, if you see your brother in error, go to such an one in a spirit of meekness, lest thou also be tempted. So, you don't, I mean, I think that's the way. But even if they came to me, like, even in a mean way, and rebuked me. And they showed me how wrong I was. I would repent, man. I, I, would, I would retract what I've been putting out for years. But I haven't had anybody do that. I only normally get responses back from the people that go to these churches where it's not being preached about. Because they think, well, if this was really true, why is not my, my preacher a man of God? Why isn't he saying anything to me? You've got to be wrong. Well, that's kind of funny because I don't get anybody refuting what I'm putting out. And it's not what I'm putting out. The other guys have already done the work for me. This is mostly, what I'm giving you today is mostly from um, Cutting Edge Ministry. Um, and some other ministries. They've done the work for me. It's easy to verify. I mean, this is not hard stuff to find out. I mean, <laughs> it really isn't. So it says, th this is another Bible verse. Um, as they were okay, so this is the last part of Hosea four, six, and seven. It says, "As they were increased, meaning as his as his people were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, will I change their glory into shame." Now, that's coming. The glory is fixing to get changed into shame. These Christians that glory, these pseudo Christians that glory in Christmas, saying that it's that it's Jesus's birthday and all this other stuff. They're fixing to get their glory turned into shame. They are. It's coming. And I don't really want to be near that bomb when it goes off. Because the Bible says judgment must begin at the house of the Lord. Judgment's coming. It's coming. And it's going to come probably to the pseudo-Christians first. I, I mean, I think we have scriptural precedent for that. Their glory is really getting ready to be... And that's why I'm so glad I'm out of the church. Because I don't want to be anything we're near that bomb when it goes off. I, I just really don't. So let's just look at this a little bit closer. You say, oh, I'm still not convinced yet. Well, let's, let's go a little bit closer, a little more. Let's look at the, um, we're going to look at the occult calendar here, okay? Now, you got to understand, pagans who've been, had this calendar for pretty much since Babylon, they're the ones that made up the occult calendar. And they're very, very superstitious people. They go by dates and times and years, and that's why the Bible warns against it. That's how they practice their religion, based on that. So, December 21st through 22nd was um, originally considered Yule. 
So when the sun begins its northward trek in the sky, and the days begin to grow longer again, the pagans celebrated the winter solstice by burning the Yule log. Since the sun had reversed itself and was now rising in the sky. In other words, the pagans believed that unless they did all these ceremonies, that the sun wouldn't do what it would and we might stay in winter forever. So they believed that, that when every season had a different God that was coming to preeminence and you, had to, and you had to have all these festivals and all these things to do in order to appease that God or else he wouldn't give you favor with uh, maybe sometimes it was the weather, the, your, your, your food stores, your crops, things like that. You had to always be giving these gods whatever they wanted, had to be having these celebrations in order to placate the gods so that they would be on your side. Okay? So, since the sun had reversed itself and was now rising in the sky, pagans believed that it was a sign that human sacrifices carried out on Halloween, which was called Samhain, had been accepted by the gods. So, in other words, the human sacrifices they did on October 31st, the evidence that those human sacrifices were accepted was when the day started getting longer again. Because, see, up until, up until um, December 21st, 22nd, the days get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. At that point, they had enough, they were advanced enough in astro uh, astrology and, and knowing the suns and the times that they could find, that they could see that the days were starting to get longer again. They believed that was because of all their pagan ceremonies that that always happened. Now, that's also another thing that where, where pride could well up in you. Not only are you, you worshiping a pagan god, but you actually think that you have the power to affect the length of days and things of this nature. So, um, I mean, Satan's just back there, just laughing away at these 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 people that he that he views as total idiots, and they're going straight to hell, and but they're doing it his way. So we continue to sing the song, "Deck the halls with boughs of holly, tra la 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 la, um, tra the ancient Yule tide carol, see the blazing Yule before us, fa la 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 la." Okay, so. These are songs that we sing at Christmas. This is just one song. There's a, most ancient Christmas songs are just pagan um, tributes. And we don't even know what we're doing. Well, we're being destroyed for lack of knowledge. The Roman Catholic Church later changed the day of celebration of, to December 25th, calling it Christmas. Okay, and again, it was called Saturnalia. Yule, things of this nature. But see, the Roman Catholic Church was the one that came in and really amalgamated all this into our societies. Now, let's look at some other things that, that have their roots in paganism. The Christmas tree. What is the Christmas tree? It's the sacred tree of the winter god. The Druids, who were these uh, basically high-level witches that were over this race called the Celts in Scotland, the Druids believed the spirit of their gods resided in the tree. Most ancient pagans knew the tree represented Nimrod, reincarnated into Tammuz. Pagans also looked upon the tree as a phallic symbol. The star that they put on top of the tree, which is called a pentaphalia, the five-point star, the pentaphalia is a powerful symbol of Satan, second only to the hexagram. See, the hexagram is the most wicked symbol in, in, in the occult. And, you know, that's why I grieve when I look at the Israeli flag and it's got a hexagram on the flag. The only other symbol that, that's, that's comparable to that, and it's in second in line, is the star, the pentagram. The star is also the sacred symbol of Nimrod. and has nothing whatsoever to do with Christianity. Number three, candles. Candles represent the sun god's newly born fire. The pagans the world over love and use candles in their rituals and ceremonies. Certain colors are also used to represent specific powers. The extensive use of candles is a very good indication that the service is pagan. Well, you could go to the um, Catholic services and see a whole bunch of candles burning. In fact, they have candle mass, where they burn candles to the dead. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's something that we should go around and do a ton of. I don't think there's any, you know... If, if, if the power goes out and stuff, you have to burn some candles or whatever. But it, I think it's your intention with the candles. It's really, it's more your, why are you burning the candle? Are you burning it for some kind of symbolic, mystical reason? Or are you burning it because you need some light in the room? You know? Uh, the extensive use of candles is usually a very good indication that the service is pagan. 
no matter what outward trappings there might be. And I, I don't think you should also go to the grocery store and buy your candles with Mary on the outside with a halo on her head, because they got those going on, too. You know, don't buy those. It's like bringing a devil into the house, you know. Mistletoe is the sacred plane of the Druids. Now, the Druids, again, were the ones that were one of the first ones, well, not the first ones, but they, they on Halloween night, they, they had their human sacrifices, and, and the human sacrifice was, was part of their religion. The Druids were, were one of the ones that really popularized a lot of these beliefs that we have in Christmas right now. Now again, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? All of this has evil beginnings. And you're telling me now all of a sudden it's not evil? Um, I mean, the Bible says to avoid even the appearance of evil. Well, in God's eyes, I would much rather err on the side of safety and even avoid the appearance of evil. Um... The, the mistletoe symbolized the pagan blessings of fertility. That's why you kiss under the, under the mistletoe, because it's a fertility thing. Thus, kissing under the mistletoe is the first step in the reproductive cycle, because kissing always leads to something else. Witches also use the white berries in their potions. Now, wreaths, you know what wreaths mean? They're circular, and they represent the female sexual organ. That's what wreaths mean. When I went to uh, New Testament Baptist, I tried to get them to get those wreaths down. And I, I gave uh, Pastor Ellis, you know, the information. Hey, I'm sorry, but this is what these mean. Can you refute this? No. No. But what I would get is a veiled rebuke from the pulpit, usually the next week. Nothing ever really refuted anything that I ever said, though. Well, you know, that's ridiculous. Rees are associated with fertility in the cycle of life. Now, when you see candles on the wreath, that's, the candles are also the symbol of the phallus, symbol of the male. And when you see the candles, it's symbolic of the uniting of the male phallus symbol with the female reproductive organ. So you got that going too. Okay? Which is what we have at St. Peter's Basilica with the, with the obelisk and the round St. Peter's Basilica, which is symbol of the female genitalia. So, you know, um, really lighthearted stuff here. Santa Claus. Former Satanists have told me that Santa is also an anagram for Satan. In fact, all you've got to do is switch a couple words around in Santa, or a couple letters in Santa to get Satan. Because Santa, if you take the, the, the letters, it's the same, same word as Satan. Um, all you got to do is flip the, uh, the N, the A and the N. That's all you got to do. In the New Age, the God... Sanat Kumara is the most de definite an, amount, an anagram for Satan. Now, again, Santa Claus, you could do a whole treatise on Santa Claus, but you, you look at him, he knows when you are sleeping, he knows when you're awake, he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. He's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's a... Doesn't Satan all, isn't Satan always trying to, to imitate what God is? God the Father? See, but Satan can't do that. He's not omniscient. He's not all-knowing. He's not omnipresent. Satan can only be in one place at one time. But see, the way Santa Claus is portrayed is he's everywhere at all times. He knows everything. It's, it's, a, uh, it's an abomination. The mythical attributes and powers ascribed to Santa are eerily close to those possessed by Jesus Christ. We have written a perennial favor article describing these similarities, and they give you a link here. We encourage, I mean, if you want to know, if you want to know more about this, go up to cuttingedge.org and do a keyword search for Christmas. And you will have your boat loaded. You probably could be up there for two or three days on all the research they've done on this. I mean, it's so overwhelming. I'm just hitting the high points here. Um... Santa Claus has been spiritually replaced Jesus Christ. If you think about it, Christmas anymore is really so much about Jesus Christ as it is about Santa. That's what the kids all know. So the kids are being corrupted at the earliest possible age. And why wouldn't they want to be? Because they get presents and they get gifts from Satan, I mean Santa. Well, doesn't that endear them to Satan? Isn't that like, isn't that like basically saying, oh, Santa gave you this or whatever. Well, isn't that basically like having that kid be endeared to Satan? Well, they don't think of it that way. They think he's just this nice, kindly old man. It doesn't matter, because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Reindeer. Reindeer are horned animals representing the horned god, or the stag god of the pagan religion. Santa's tradition of reindeer in his team of eight 
in satanic ger ger germatria, which is like the study of numbers in Satanism, eight is the number of the new beginnings. Now, I'm not saying there's not a biblical way you could also you could study numbers, but what this is symbolic of in the satanic view is eight is the number of new beginnings, or the cycle of reincarnation. The Illuminati views the number eight as the symbol of their new world order, because see, they want to have a new world order, and, it, and it's a rebirth. Okay, like the phoenix bird, which they use a lot, rising from its own ashes. The phoenix bird dies and is burned up, and out of its own ashes it rises again. This is a symbol of reincarnation, what we get into. Elves. Elves are imp-like creatures, Satan's little helpers. They are also demons. Red and green are the traditional colors of the season. They are the traditional colors, pagan colors of winter. Green is Satan's favorite color, so it is appropriate it should be one of the traditional colors for Christmas. Red is the color of human blood, Satan's highest form of sacrifice. For this reason, communism developed its red as its main color. Okay, That's why communists have the red and, and the sickle on a red flag. That's what that's from. It's, it's a red, yeah. Does that mean the color green is bad and we should go out and kill No, I'm not, no, Taylor. I'm not trying to get us to slaughter reindeers or anything. Reindeers in and of themselves aren't evil, but it's what they're representing. It's how Satan... I understand that. Because I'm sure if they could talk, they would. Yeah, I know, but sa sa Satan's reindeers are a little bit different. They fly in the sky. They have magical powers. Well, I know, but that's, what, but that's what's portrayed. See, it's always a perversion. It's always a perversion, these things. A, well, because that's what they do. Anyway, um, I already talked about what December 25th is. Um, okay, so that's we're, we're done there on that one. Um, so, anyway, I don't know, did, did I talk about this last week, about Walmart selling their gay sex manuals? I did? Okay. And um, that they've got another book now called The Little Black Book for Girls, a book on healthy sexuality. Did I talk about that? Okay. Um, it's the it's the promotion of the teen lesbian sex manual that they're selling uh, for on little young girls how to engage in homosexual acts. Um, uh, and then it says the conservative press is starting to wake up. Um, now they've got. Walmart is refusing to explain why a sexually explicit manual... Oh, I, what I did is I think I just read you a little excerpt. But they've got, they've got four gay sex manuals they're selling at Walmart, too. Um, the ins and outs of gay sex. The joy of gay sex. Best gay love stories of 2005. It shows these guys basically just on the verge of kissing. And then the rebel yell. So these are pictures of the four books here. Did I show you those last week? See, yeah, see, I, I, I exactly, exactly, because it's their favorite store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got virtually no. Yeah, that's all that matters. So these are some other fine, wholesome products you can buy at Walmart. Um, we talked about the book last week. Um, uh, but Doug, these are the, the, the Walmart's also got four, four gay sex manuals they're selling now. Um, so, you know, oh, hey, Dad. Taylor, please, quite interrupt me. Oh, well, you, if any place you would, you would see it. Um, that, that's where you'd see it. Um, they, then the World Daily Net said Walmart is refusing to explain why a sexually explicit manual on how to be a lesbian was pulled suddenly from its website just hours after the World Daily Net story period. Well, at least they pulled it from their website. Family organizations in Canada had warned about the book, book just weeks ago while it called God a fat black uh, D-Y-K-E. That's what this book referred to God as. Now, I'm telling you, judgment can't be far off. It can't. And provides how-to information for same-sex experimentation. The store described it as stuff youth needed to know. Uh, and um, this little black book for girls, a book on healthy sexuality. It's 
produced by St. Stephen's Community House in Toronto, an organization that has fled its actually original Christian foundation. The book was posted on the site through late yesterday and early today, but suddenly disappeared um, when asked Walmart, when they asked Walmart why they pulled it, they just gave them this generic response, but didn't go into details. Um, the co-author of the book, which calls God that phrase I just said, financed by all three levels of the Canadian government, financed this book, was the 2004 recipient of a Governor General Award. See, Satan will reward you for, for saying this type of stuff. If, if you want to get the more blasphemous you get, the more Satan will reward you. Um, and then this is... Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if I showed you this before. The, it's entitled, Sex Toys for Kids. We need a bigger cup for the, all the filth to flow over. Mother of two of... Two, Karen Gilmore was searching for Christmas gifts for her two daughters, Laura and Sarah, 10 and 11, when she came to across the toy Tesco has been forced to remove it's a pole dancing kit from Toys and Games section directed the website um, accused of destroying the children's innocence. The Tesco direct site advertises the kit with the words now this is how they're advertising, it's a little pole dancing kit. They have this little pole dancing thing that you can get. Now if you don't you know what a pole dancing is? In, in the strip bars, they got these poles. And the, the strippers go up there, and they have the stages, and the strippers hang on the poles and, and twirl around them and do all kind of tricks off the poles and, and, you know, show their goods to the guys, and it gets them all fired up, you know. That's what pole dancing is. Well, now they've got a pole dancing kit for little girls. And it's a real pole. It goes from the top of your thing to the, to the bottom of your... Of your they, and the, the Tesco Direct site advertises the kit with the words. Now, Tesco is a pretty prominent toy manufacturer. It's not like some fringe one. I've seen Tesco for a lot of years. It's, the, the kit has on it, it says, Unleash the Sex Kitten Inside. This is, this is like something from, it's getting to the point where it's almost like something from a movie. It's like you're living this bad nightmare. And then it says, simply extend the peekaboo pole inside the tube, slip on the sexy tunes, and away you go. You'll be flaunting it to the world and earning a fortune in the peekaboo dance dollars. Dude, I, I can't even believe what they're doing. This is unbelievable. The it's the forty nine ninety seven. I think that means forty nine pounds. Comprises a chrome pole. This is what you get in, in now. The, I had I had a picture, but it didn't print out on here. It showed it showed a picture of it. You get a chrome pole, which extends to eight feet six inches, which can hit your ceiling. A sexy dance garter garter belt, and a DVD demonstrating suggestive dance moves. The kit, condemned as extremely dangerous by family campaigners yesterday, well, thank God, was discovered by mother of two, Karen Gilmore, who was searching for Christmas gifts for her two daughters. Mrs. Gilmore, 33, of Cheshire, England, said yesterday, I'm no prude, but any child, children, can go up on there and see it, and it's, it's just not, it's just not on, whatever that means. Dr. Adrian Rogers of, fam, of family campaigning group Family Focus said yesterday that the kit would destroy children's lives. He said Tesco is Britain's number one chain, They're the number one chain in Britain. Uh, this is extremely dangerous. It is an open invitation to turn the youngest children on to sexual behavior. This will be sold to four, five, and six-year-olds. This is the most dangerous toy that will contribute toward the destroying of children's innocence. I mean, it's, it's absolutely incomprehensible what's going on right now. Yeah, I mean, just in time for Christmas. No, you can pray against it, though. Well, it, you got to understand, though, too, in, in Europe, it's worse, in some ways, it's worse than it is here as far as what the level of perversion they've let come. I mean, you can go over there and watch regular TV and get full frontal nudity on, t on TV over there.
two young kids were looking all through and picked out like three or four. And I thought, then I can get to buy that. Let's catch one of the two more and see what I want. And she said, you can only have two. She never checked without. Well, she looked. Well, she looked. She well, knew they were adults. She was, you couldn't have three. You yeah. couldn't have three. You had to only get two. She was buying it for not. Oh, she wow. Was probably doing the high school. Well, I can't tell the ages, but it wasn't much older than her. Wow. Uh, that's that's the state we're living in. Um, in Europe now, in England in particular, you got to understand that's going to be really where the, part of the headquarters of the New World Order, the One World Religion, that the Antichrist is going to um, emanate, most likely from London and probably the Rome, the Vatican. Um, the highest of the highest of the high, really, um, their orders come from England, and in England. There's more witches per capita in England than on any place in Earth. So, if you were going to see this any place, it wouldn't surprise me that it'd be England. Um, this last little article was from um, Tom Horn. It says, scientists have speaking in tongues on their mind. And um, this was by Science Now Daily News. For the practice that's been around for thousands of years, scientists understood very little about, about what goes on when people speak in tongues. Currently... Glossophalalia, as it is called, can be found, now that's a technical way of speak, called speaking in tongues, can be found in the Pentecostal and the charismatic Christian sects, where those affected believe that they are uttering a message directly from God. Now, scientists say that they have captured glossophalalia on brain scans. Now, this is very interesting, very interesting, which, okay, when they, when they captured it on, on brain scans, which link decreased frontal lobe activity to a loss of self-control. Now, if Jesus is going to do something through somebody, I don't see any New Testament precedent for that person losing control over their own faculties. I don't see any New Testament precedent where they went and laid hands on somebody and they passed out and fainted backwards, which is typically something you see in the charismatic churches. Um, I don't see it anywhere in the New Testament. So now, if they're doing something that's never even been documented in the New Testament, then I think you want, might want to ra raise an eyebrow about this thing. Now, here's another thing. If speaking in tongues... I'm not saying God couldn't do that. Okay, I'm not saying... I'm not going to limit God and say that there couldn't be an example in today's modern age where God couldn't use that. I don't want to put God in a box. But, I have to look at what is the fruit. What is the fruit of what I see people speak in tongues? And I'm going to tell you what I personally viewed. Uh, when I did this Prophecy Club tour, met a lot of people that were Charismatics. Um, I came out of the Charismatic Church, hardcore Charismatic. I'm not talking about, I mean, I was hardcore when I was doing this stuff. And all I can tell you is my observations. The Bible says, by their fruit you shall know them. Now, I'm not saying that Charismatics are, are all bad people. Because I think many of them are very, very sincere. In fact, I think a lot of them are more sincere than most of your lukewarm Christians. And they think, they believe that they're truly on fire for God, and they believe that they're, but see, this whole tongues thing, what it does is it's a, it's an issue of pride. They think, well, I'm filled with the Spirit, and you're not, and I'm better than you, whether they want to admit it or not. Now listen, you're talking to somebody that used to do this, okay? So, don't tell me I have no right to judge, because I have walked in those shoes before, and I know how you can start feeling do, doing this. It's very dangerous from that standpoint. Well, when you start feeling like you're better than one another, what's that? That's pride. Then that's the most abominable sin in God's eyes. What does pride do? It blinds you to truth. These people are being blinded because they think they're better in part. That's part of the reason. You start to think you're better. Well, I'm more holy. Then you start thinking that you're getting direct revelations from God that other people are not getting. And, there's, and then here's the last thing that happens. Things that are unbiblical, that go against Scripture, when you start believing you're hearing these things, even though they go against Scripture, you believe that they take precedence over the Word of God. Now, what you're doing is, you've made up your own religion. You're starting to believe things and, 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 and hear words supposedly from God that you tell other people that you never did hear from God. The Bible says, I never sent them. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 18, what's the test of a prophet? If what he says comes to pass... What was the penalty for that in the Old Testament? Death. If, you, if what they said did not come to pass, it was death. Death. Read Deuteronomy 8, 18, uh, verses, I believe, 18 through 20. 
So, I'm not saying you kill him today, there's no biblical precedence for killing anybody, but I believe that, that the charismatics, the ones that I have been around, are the most, um, have the most problems of any other sect of whatever you call it, Christianity, than any other people. I have never seen a group of people with more personal problems, with more problems than being around charismatic Christians. And they get so far off base on doctrine. They, they don't normally adhere to the Word of God. They don't normally adhere to the King James being the Word of God. They go by experience. What is this called? This is called existentialism, which is where your experience is what makes up your belief system. Well, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. That's Proverbs 16, verse 2. So, they get, they get hooked on a feeling. Hooked on a feeling. And here, the brain scans are actually proving now that there is a decrease in frontal lobe activity when they're praying in tongues, which is equating to a loss of self-control. Well, if the Holy Spirit lives inside you, granted, you want the Holy Spirit to take over and, and, and to live through you and work through you. But this isn't the same thing. This is different here. To, to conduct the study, psychiatrist Andrew Newberg of the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and his colleagues recruited five African-American women who belong to local Pentecostal congregations. Now, I'm sorry, but I have seen the blacks particularly tend to get very, 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 very deceived on this point. Now, now, I'm saying the whites don't either. But, oh man, you deal with a black Pentecostal charismatic woman? Oh, they may be very nice. They may be very, very nice people. And I'm not saying they couldn't be saved, but I'm saying that most of the time, they're very sincere, but they're very, very, very sincerely deceived. Okay? Very few people, I don't, I don't have to say this without sounding prejudiced, but I've run across very, very few black people I've ever run across have a real thirst to really, really, really maintain and go toward purity of doctrine and really, really, really walk in the truth. It doesn't seem to matter to them as much. I hate to say that, and I don't mean to be mean, and I don't mean to be prejudiced. I'm talking, what are my observations? What, am I, what is it? Now, granted, most of the whites are no better. But I'm telling you, I can point to very, very few black people that I have seen that have a comprehension or want to know this or, or whether it even matters to them. You know, I, I mean, I know I get a lot of heat for saying that, but I, I'm just being honest. I mean, I wish it wasn't so. And I'm not saying the, the, the white races or the other races are much better. Okay? Um, it says here then, so, five African American women who belong to local Pentecostal congregations. And if you've ever seen a, a black woman praying in tongues, you talk about getting theatrical. The Bible says that you do everything in decency and in order. The Bible also says to lay sud hands on suddenly on no man. To lay hands, well, that's what they do with these things. Oh, brother, I got a word from the Lord. Woo! Fill them, fill them, double dose, double dose, double dose, you know, and everybody's falling over backwards and you got them catching them and catching them. And I'm, one time I, I was a catcher at one of these, these, uh, these, uh, charismatic things. This, this one guy was in town and I was a catcher and I was catching them and I caught them and I went down because, and I just ripped my pants all the way to the back and I didn't know I had done it. And I'm walking around. Yeah, and I, had, I had no idea. I had ripped my pants from crotch to up all the way to the back. I had my underwear hanging. That was great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so see, nobody's going to come to me and say, well, you don't know, you haven't been there. Oh, have I been there. I was one of the most radical Pentecostals you could imagine. Really? But maybe maybe God was doing that to, to get our attention. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It would be like 
if you have this one, it talks in French, and this That's one right. talks in Spanish. That's right. There was a reason. You have another person that understood that could tell you what they were Exactly. Do. It has nothing to do with this gibberish that they go on. I agree. I agree. It was for edifying of the body of Christ. It was it was for another person who couldn't understand. They didn't speak that language to give them the gospel. Well, when they spoke in the tongue, they all heard it. I mean, we can look at that at, 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 at Pentecost. I mean, but, it had five words. It, God would rather have five words. That's right. Words that you could understand than 10,000 that nobody understood. Yeah, I think I'm going to look at that real quick today when we get done. Yeah. Sure. Uh huh. Yes. Um, we we just had um, um, one of our parishioners, <laughs> lay people. Um, she was telling us an experience how actually what three of us come out of a Pentecostal background um, here, and uh, she was saying that when she would speak in tongues, there was this one particular word that would come into her remembrance, and and that was the word Kali. And it wasn't it wasn't until later that you found out what the word meant. Yeah, she had never heard it. Now, what Kali is, is you spell it K-A-L-I. It's not like a, the dog Kali. Okay? It's K-A-L-I. Taylor, please stop interrupting me. Um, and what it means, it's the second highest Hindu deity in the Hindu pantheon of their millions of gods. And they've literally got millions. Um, including the god of dung and the god of feces and these fun gods. Well, um, the number one Hindu deity is Shiva, who is the god of destruction, and it, that is supposedly the father of Kali. Now, Kali, if you ever see her depicted and you want to see a picture of her, just do a keyword search on the internet. You type in K-A-L-I, or you can get some of the Jack Chick tracks, the one in Hinduism, and it shows a picture of her, and she is uh, about nine feet tall, or ten feet. She's this gigantic-looking, wild-eyed, demon-possessed demon, devil, that has six arms, the two arms, uh, one arm has is holding a, a dead head, and then another arm has a basin to catch the blood dropping into the basin, and then another arm has a sword, and she has, uh, for her belt, she has, I believe it's human hands, or make up her belt, or something like that, she's got dead heads hanging all off her, that's Kali. Now, that is, that is a good example of of when you let your uh, you let go with your subconscious mind, and you lose control, and you willfully give control over to the spirits. This is what happens. This is what drugs do. But there's different ways to induce these states, and and one of them, I believe, is through the speaking in tongues, because your your voluntary mind, your your conscious mind, kind of takes goes off here, and now this. This involuntary part, these spirits basically are controlling. So, um, these um, these local Pentecostal women were observed, and uh, all had been in the habit of speaking in tongues almost on a daily basis for the past five years. Um, as a controlled activity, the subjects stood and sang gospel songs with the musical accompaniment, moving their arms and swaying. Then they were asked to repeat the behavior, but this time the researchers encouraged them to speak in tongues rather than singing. And evidently, they had them hooked up to some kind of monitoring devices. In each case, the scientists gave the subjects an intravenous injection of a radioactive tracer that provided, in effect, a freeze frame of the brain areas where they were most active during this behavior as indicated by increased blood flow. Now, this is pretty scientific stuff they're doing here. This isn't some stupid little science project they're doing here. They're, 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 they're injecting radioactive tracers into these people to see where their brain activity was more. This was captured then by scanning the women's brains in a single photo, photon emission computer tomography called an SPECT um, machine, a SPECT machine. Very, very advanced machines. I've dealt with them before with what I do in chiropractic. So... This glossophilia, which is also speaking in tongues, produced a significantly different pattern of brain activity than when they were singing. The team reports in the November issue of the Psychiatry Research, neuroimaging, perhaps the most important, in neuroimaging, perhaps the most important, was a decrease in frontal lobe function. Newberg says the part of the brain that normally makes them feel in control has essentially been shut down. Oh, now you're telling me that is of God? He's just shutting everything down? 
Well, the Pentecostal would, would argue back to me, yes, because the Holy Spirit's taken over. And we're, and we're, you know, we're just, the Holy Spirit's working through us to such an extent that our, we are so crucified with Christ. We are so just given over to God that this is happening. Now, again, we look in the Old, the New Testament, the main use for speaking in tongues was, was when they had people that were of another, um, uh, dialect that could not understand, and you, all you have to do is look at Pentecost. When, when Pentecost happened, um, and the apostles were tearing in, in the upper room, and these people were speaking a different language, and there were other people there that, that actually understood the gospel in their own language, essentially. See, it was, it was a very, very quick way to propagate the gospel. Can we use that excuse anymore? Not really. I mean, it, I guess it could happen, but not to the extent where, where we... Um, where they were working with back then. So it says that um, another notable change was increased activity in the parietal lobe, the part of the brain that takes sensory information and tries to create a sense of self and how you relate to the rest of the world. Now this would, to me, fall under the guise of um, an experience. You know, wow, it felt this way and it felt so real, it had to be real. No matter if it was counter to the Bible or not, as long as it felt right. Well, that's true. The findings make sense, says Newberg, because speaking in tongues involves relinquishing control while gaining a very intense experience of how the self relates to God. Interestingly, he notes that glossophilia responses were the opposite of those seen in subjects in a meditative state. When people meditate on a particular sacred object, Newberg has found that their frontal lobe activity increases. Now, that could be the Bible. You, you could actually meditate on the Word of God and find that the frontal lobe actually increases, meaning the area of self-control actually increases. So, But that's not the case here. It actually decreases. So while their parietal activity goes down, um, their frontal lobe activity increases while their parietal activity goes down. And these are the people that are just meditating. This conforms with the notion that in meditation one has a controlled focus while losing a sense of self. In an excellent study, says psychologist Michael Prisner, the University of Ontario, um, glossophoralgia, each of Dr. Newberg's results has specific implications, he says. For example, increased parietal activity would go with a sense of oneself being touched by the spirit. See, it's all about experience. And, and it, is, it is a great deception of Satan because... The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yes, it's always easier and it's always more pleasant to go with what our heart would say. I mean, isn't that what the world teaches? Oh, go with your heart. Your heart will never... Yes, it will. Yeah, it will. It sure will deceive you. But, you know, oh, that, that goes against what's, what's popular or what's, or, or, what is, um, or what's like to be preached on. It's 12.30 already? Oh, my word. Well, okay. Let's just go real quick. Um, i got to find it. It's, I think it's in Corinthians. Uh, I'll just touch on... Uh, let's see. I think it's 2 Corinthians. That's uh, where they talk about tongues. Well, maybe it's not. Uh, maybe it's Romans. Yeah, I thought it was too. Here it is. Um, oh no, it's not it. Uh, here it is. It's it's Corinthian First Corinthians fourteen. I'm just going to hit the high points because we're already at twelve thirty, and I don't want to keep you too long here. Um. Uh, so let's just go. Let's just go to verse thirteen, um, verse verse seven, and these are things that we should do. Okay, um, beareth all things, and this is talking about charity. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth in all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Charity is the, basically the highest expression of love. But whether there shall be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. So the Bible talks about a day when tongues shall cease. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. 1 Corinthians. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. 
Um, and then let's go down, now, and then in verse 12 it says, for, for we see through a glass darkly, that's a verse I like to quote quite a bit, because, you know, we, we can't figure out everything to the nth degree in this dispensation, it's just not going to happen. Um, so follow after charity and desire, this is verse 1, chapter 14, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how that in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Well, to me, if, if you're doing this, then what good would it be if you were speaking in tongues and there was really nobody there that was going to benefit from this? I mean, it, it, to me it seems like that he speaketh unto man but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how that in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification. So in other words, when you prophesy in this context, you're edifying. Edifying means you build up somebody. Okay, when you do this. Um, verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Okay, so speaking in tongues in this particular context, you would be building up yourself in a, in, if this was biblical tongues they're in reference to. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy. In other words, I would rather you would all prophesy than speak in tongues, because prophesying edifies others. For greater is he that prophesieth than, than he that speaketh in tongues. So, in other words, speaking in tongues is being downplayed here. Except ye interpret that the church may receive edifying. So, in this particular dispensation, somebody could come up and, and speak in tongues and interpret and now, you will see a lot of this going on in supposedly charismatic circles. The problem I have with this whole thing is that, what is the fruit? What is the fruit? I've heard, I've been in many a charismatic services where somebody went up and spoke in tongues, and another man got up and interpreted the tongue, and it sounded great. But the thing was, is why wasn't the guy that was interpreting, if this truly was the voice of God, why was he speaking, for the most part, why wasn't he rebuking the congregation? If the Holy Spirit was really going to speak to that congregation, you're telling me with all the sin that is in the camp that the Holy Spirit wouldn't be rebuking? And I hear a whole lot of that. I heard a lot of things that were building, oh, you're going to do mighty things and all this other stuff. Well, hold on. I don't, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me now. Now, in retrospect, the time I didn't know it felt great. Felt You felt great walking out of there. But... Many times I would hear, particularly at Kingsway, there's this one guy that always supposedly interpreted. And I'm not saying he never said any hard things, but my word, why wouldn't God be commanding us in the foundational issues? Why wouldn't God be making mention of, put away your perverted Bibles, put away your state-run churches, put away this... this, this um, charismania, all these feelings and all this rock music, why wasn't any of that, if the Holy Spirit was really in control, why wasn't any of that brought up? I never hear any of that brought up, ever. Well, by their fruits you shall know them. So see, I look more at the fruit of it, okay? It wasn't happening. So it says, now brethren, if I come to you and speak with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge, or by prophesying or by doctrine. In other words, these are profitable. But speaking in tongues really isn't profitable unless there's one there to interpret. Well, who's going to be, who is right with God right now in one of these churches that's going to really be able to properly interpret? And who's going to be right that's going to actually be speaking in tongues in a biblical manner because everybody has so much sin in their life? How can God really use these people? What is, does it, I mean, does God just turn his back and say, well, yeah, I know that they're that they're totally operating in sin and they're totally deceived and they're totally in all these heresies, but I'm going to use them anyway. He doesn't normally use that. He normally will use clean vessels. Not vessels that are corrupted and dirty. Not to say he couldn't clean them up, but you show me one person that's a charismatic that's not a dirty vessel, basically, anymore. Well, how do we become dirty? False doctrine? Embracing lies? Staying in lies? And then saying it's of God. This is some of the ways. Um, so it says, And things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harp? This is in reference to tongues. Because you can't know 
what tongues are really saying unless ones they're going to interpret. They're, they're given uncertain sound. For if a trumpet given uncertain sound, who should prepare himself to the battle? Well, here's another thing. What if what you're being told when somebody's praying in tongues is giving you the wrong stuff, which is mostly what's happening? They tell you things that you like to hear and things that feel good and things of this nature. Well, hold on. Um, that's all well and good, but am I to trust this? Am I to trust this word that I've just been given? You know how many words that I've been given by par and they're normally nice stuff. They normally I normally can't be mad at the person giving me the word because they're saying something pretty nice to me. You'll be mightily used, mighty man of God, man of valor, the whole nine yards. And and it's like, um, it feels good, and it's hard to get mad at the person saying this to you, and they're, oh, brother, i got a word of the Lord for you, and I'm, I'm, I'm just... Well, yeah, yeah, but this is even worse. This is worse, because you, this is like you're getting a direct revelation from the throne of God himself, you know, and it's like, and you start to feel like, oh, I'm pretty special. You know, I'm a pretty big guy here. I'm, I'm a big cheese. And then you can go out and... And you know what? And if you've got sin in your life and you're living like the devil and you get one of these words, you, you start thinking, well, God must not think too much of my sin. I'm going to keep doing it. I know. But you see how dangerous this is? It's dangerous stuff. So, to Trump and give an uncertain sound, he should prepare himself to battle. Well, again, I would rather err on the side of safety. So likewise, ye accept ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? In other words, if you don't, if you utter words, make sure that they're understandable. For ye shall speak into the air. Um, so it says then, it says verse 12, Even so, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Well, that is under the premise of here prophesying, or doctrine, or things of this nature. Were you going to say something, Onetta? Okay. Um... Okay, so this is the theme. Okay, this is the theme of what we're talking about here. It's really, this verse 12 is actually the theme for the rest of this chapter of 1 Corinthians 14. For so, for as much as yours also spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speak in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. Else what shall thou bless with the spirit? How shall thou he that occupieth the room of an unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what he saith? Again, this is trying to compare the distinction between praying in tongues and praying something coherent. Or, or giving doctrine that is easily understood, like what we're talking about. You understand what I'm saying. You understand I'm speaking in English. Whereas in tongues, you're not normally doing that. Um, now... Yeah. Well, and also I have a note here. Paul needed needed this gift in his day and age because he went to more foreign locations to preach where people didn't understand. Okay? Um, but even then, tongues are downplayed. Tongues are downplayed in this whole chapter. If you look at this, really the last two chapters. Um, for verily... For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. In other words, with tongues you don't edify people typically. Um, but anymore, you know, you got all these Christians that 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 that, that are that are uh, tongue speakers, and they, they're saying, "I got a word from God," and they're all edifying, all sounds good. But you look at that person, and they're the biggest mess on the planet. And I'm thinking, they're so such a mess. And yet they're telling me this word, and yet their own house is so messed up. How can I be knowing what they're saying is the truth? I mean, look at their own life. 
not to say that we're to judge and say, well, I'm better. It's just that, I mean, I think it's reasonable to question somebody who's totally messed up, which is your typical Pentecostal. I'm sorry. I've been there. I've done it. I think I have a right to render an opinion about this. I was messed up when I was doing it. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. So now, see, he did. He was somebody that did it, been there, done it. He's done it. But he had a very specific reason for speaking in tongues more than them all because he was in more foreign locations than them all. He went from city to city to city. One city may have a different language they spoke. Well, these other people weren't doing the same thing. They weren't traveling from city to city. So he had a, he had a reason to speak more in tongues than them all. Yet, in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding. Now, this is from somebody who was probably the king of tongues. Paul was like the, probably the king of tongues, because he was the one that was going to form more foreign locations. He needed that to spread the gospel more than anybody else. But, he says, even, even so, even so, yet, in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding then by my voice I might teach others also, then 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. 10,000 compared to 5? That's a pretty big difference. Um, brethren, be not children in understanding. How, how bet, meaning nevertheless, that's what that word how bet means. Brethren, be not children in understanding. How bet, in malice, be children, but in understanding be men. Okay, now, um, be not children in understanding. How, how, nevertheless, or how bet, in malice, be children. But in understanding, be men. Okay, there's a time when you're supposed to grow up. Okay, as a Christian. You want to be an understanding person. It's not going to be a little child who can grasp some knowledge, but he's not going to understand it like a grown-up's going to understand things. Um, Isaiah 28.9 I kind of started on this, and I don't really want to... I kind of want to hit the high points here. Isaiah 28, 9... Um, 28, verses... Um, um, actually, verse 1. Woe unto the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim. Okay, now this is the context of the chapter. Woe to Ephraim. Okay, we're dealing with, with the Jews here primarily. Okay, um, This is dealing with, uh, if we start at verse 9, Who can teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from milk and drawn from the breasts. See, this is the state of the church today. Who can God teach knowledge and show doctrine to? Those that are weaned from the breast. That would imply they're not a baby anymore. Okay. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little, there a little. For a stammering lips and another tongue will I speak unto this people. This people. Who's to this people? Well, what's the context of this chapter to Ephraim? To, to the Jews. Well, hold on. It says, To his stammering lips and in another tongue will I speak unto this people. Well, this has an application to when tongues would be spoke unto this people, Ephraim. The Jews. This is where, this is, these are the people that heard tongues primarily at the beginning. They were the ones. It says, To this people will I speak with the stammering lips and another tongue. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So the Jews, for the most part, did not hear the message. That's why most of the Jews didn't get saved. That's why the Bible says, Blindness in part has happened to the Jew to the fullness of the Gentile come in. He predicted here, at one time, he was going to speak to the Jew with stammering lips and another tongue. He predicted it. And that's where it says, when we go back to verse 21 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says, in, in the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. See, it was predicted in the law. In the law it is written. Where is it written? Where we were just at. Isaiah 28, verse, um, verse 11. 
Isaiah 28, verse 11 and 12. Okay, that's, that's our reference, okay? It says, in the law it is written, where? Where we just read. It is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Who is this people in the reference to here? The Jews. So, here's another thing. The tongues view has in light particularly an emphasis on speaking to the Jew because it predicted it here in Isaiah 28. It says, to the drunkards of Ephraim. Ephraim. Ephraim is part of the Jews, okay? Um, let me just see one other thing. Isaiah, because I've already went down this rabbit trail, I don't, I, I, this is one thing that's kind of hard to leave off. Um, Ephraim, okay? If And you don't have to turn here, but um, I just want to reiterate that what is Ephraim? Okay, if you go to chapter 7 of, verse, of Isaiah 7, and you go to verse 2, and it says, And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is in confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, and the trees and the wood are moved as the wind. Okay, now Ephraim, what it's saying here, Syria, which is not a Jewish nation, is in confederate with Ephraim, which is a Jewish nation. Now, if we go to the note here in Schofield, which I don't like to do a ton, but it, I am going to do it here. The note says, for this thing when it, in regard to Ephraim, in the, prophetic, in the prophetic books, Ephraim and Israel are the collective names of the ten tribes under Jeroboam. Established the northern kingdom, sub, subsequently called Samaria. And we're in um, B.C. 722, sent into exile, still continues. Now, I said all that to say this. Ephraim and Israel are the collective names of the ten tribes, of the Jews. So, see, you've got to understand, there's a whole, this is never talked about in the churches, that this whole tongues concept is really particularly pertaining to the Jew, because it was predicted in Isaiah 28, um, where it talks about, it says, um, For stammering lips and another tongue will I speak unto this people. And to whom he said, This is the rest, where ye shall cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Okay, now, what is the rest? Well, really the rest is in Christ Jesus. The rest that, that was going to be predicted was, the Bible says, Jesus said, Come unto me all the year that are heavy laden, laden, I shall give you rest. Well, it is a rest from the burden of the law that they were trying to keep, that the law could never perfect a man. See, Jesus was a better covenant. Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And he still is. But it says, Come on all, all unto me, ye, ye that are heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. Well, the Jewish religion had evolved into something that was a burdensome stone to most people. And, and it was like this gigantic load they were trying to carry on their back. Number one, it wasn't even biblical anymore because they had added, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had perverted it with their leaven. And it was this burdensome stone, and now Jesus comes, and he basically offers to give them rest through a better covenant. So see, this is all tied together with this. And, and it's hard, you've got to do a lot of flipping back and forth to kind of really reiterate it into your mind, what is this all talking about? Um, uh, and I, I got a note here, I hadn't even read this. The rest is being referred to, the rest that's being referred to here, is the rest in the Lord that it was only possible through salvation by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The origi and this originally happened at Pentecost, the, which is when the Holy Spirit came down and they had cloven tongues of fire on their head and they did actually speak in tongues. That's when all, Now, you ever heard a, a sermon preached on what I'm talking about here? I don't think I've ever heard one. But God showed me this a long time ago. And I don't think I've ever preached on this before, but, but it's, it's interesting. Um, indwelling the Holy Spirit that originally happened at Pentecost, the same time that the biblical tongues were first heard. Yet, for the most part, the Jews would not hear. But the Bible predicted this was going to happen here. Okay, so now, we go back to verse 21 of, of chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. It says, in the law it is written. We just saw where it was written, in the law. And that was Isaiah 28, verse 11 and 12. In the law is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. What is this people? Ephraim. The ten, well, Ephraim was really considered the ten tribes of the Jews. Unto this people. And yet, for all this, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. So it was just one more confirmation that, that here Jesus comes, he fulfills all these prophecies in the Bible, he, he, he does all these miracles on earth, and the Bible says the Jews require a sign, 
and the Greeks seek after knowledge, well, it, partly that wasn't all the Jews' fault because that is the way that God dealt with them is through signs and wonders. You know, all you got to do is look to Egypt and, and, and these things and what happened in the wilderness and they were fed with manna and, and, and doves. And, I mean, these were miracles that were happening ongoing. So, I mean, I can't really come down too hard on the Jew for, for, um, for wanting to have a sign. Well, see, Jesus gave them that, though. I mean... But he also goes on to say, and he says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and no sign shall be given unto them but the sign unto Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, so Jesus did say that also about seeking a sign. And it's something that, as a Gentile, we're not supposed to seek. Okay, because it's very dangerous because, hey, you got all... The Bible says, how's Antichrist coming back? In 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 2, he's going to come back with all lying signs and wonders. And the Bible says that if, if Satan can be transformed into an angel of light, is it, is it no marvel that his ministers also be transformed into angels of light? It's no big shake. He can do it. So, um, he, he, this is... This is a complicated subject we're dealing with here, but it is tied together, and you have to look at it in totality. You have to look at the big picture here. So, it says, Unto this people, yet they will not hear me, saith the Lord. This is just one way he said he was going to deal with them. And they're not going to hear him on this either. They didn't hear Jesus Christ when he came back. They didn't pay attention to the apostles. They're not going to pay attention to the tongues. Okay? Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not unto them that believe, but to them that believe not. Now these were really in reference to the unbelieving Jews. But to them that believe not. Why? Because it's almost like God gives them all these chances. You know, I mean, He gives them all these chances to accept Him as Lord and Savior. I don't know how much more obvious He could have made it that He was the Messiah. Yet for all that, they rejected him and basically put him on the cross. Well, you could say, oh, no, they didn't. Pilate didn't. No, they didn't because Pilate gave them the option. They said, well, I mean, he was trying. At least Pilate was at least trying. He, he knew Jesus'. Is, I mean, Pilate's wife said, have no part of this man's innocent blood. He's haunted me in my dreams. So, so Pilate didn't want to do this. I mean, if it was up to Pilate, a lot of people come down hard on Pilate. Granted, I'm not saying he's not burning in hell. But... It was the Jews coercing Pilate over and over. No, no, no. Take away Jesus. Give us Barabbas. Give us the murderer. Let his blood be upon us and our children. Man. They couldn't reject it in much more many ways. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. These are the unbelieving um, Jews. So, and then it says, but prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, which are the Jews, but to them which believe, which would just be believers. See, the Jews, for the most part, weren't believers. For the most, not all, because obviously we have the, the apostles. And obviously we have a lot of the, their converts, okay? But, for the most part, blindness in part has happened to the Jew, to the fullness of the Gentile come in, because they did reject their Savior. And he came to the Jew first. It says it right there. Um, um, Mark 16, 7, can, I don't know, can I keep going on here? I mean, are you okay? Okay, um, because I, I started this, and I should, probably should have done this next week, but we got on the soul issue of tongues. And, um, uh, Mark sixteen seventeen. This is one of those things that's hard to put down and go back to. You know, it's like, ugh. Okay, so Mark sixteen seventeen. And these, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Okay, this is following them that believe. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, these are in reference much much to what the apostles did. Okay? Much to what the, ap the uh, apostles did in this particular time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so, um... um well, exactly. The, the, the talking in tongue people, when you when they say, well, I talk in new tongues, that means I am, I'm a believer. Okay, well, okay, well, hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you also casting out devils? Are you also um, taking up serpents? And, 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 and if you get bit, you know, it's not going to hurt you. Or if you drink anything deadly, is it not hurting you? It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. and they shall, Are you doing all of that too? 
Because if you really want to put somebody in a box there, you're doing all this stuff. Now, I'm not saying God couldn't do this in today's day and age. But I'm saying that, that the signs, the, the Jew required the sign. And Jesus came back for his Jews first, and they rejected him. So then we got, okay, well now we're going to have to shift gears. Okay? And that's when a lot of this stuff started fading out as far as the modern day church. Now, I don't see any of these martyrs that were going to the cross during the, the cap, and who, who, I mean, who am I compared to myself to one of these martyrs? These are real Bible believing, gonna die, and my whole family's gonna die, get, go to the cross and be burned. If this was the case, and, and you're telling me those martyrs weren't right with God? Well, no, they couldn't have been, because they weren't doing all these other things. Give me a break. Give me a break. There's a time and a season for everything. Okay, and I'm not going to put God in a box and say that, that, that He couldn't use a person to do these things in today's day and age, but I believe the reason... Do you notice all these things are signs and wonders? Every single one of them. Even the tongues is a sign and a wonder. Well, why isn't this happening today? Exactly. Okay? So... And it was and it was more emphasized in toward things were toward the Jews at that point. Um, Acts two six. Acts two six says, Now when this was noised abroad and the multitude came together, and they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language, which is the purpose of tongues. It not only was it to help propagate the gospel, but it was a sign for the Jew. It was a sign. Okay, now we could go down that rabbit trail, but I just want to kind of touch on that. Um, so, and again, we go to verse 5, and, and they were all, uh, let's just go to the start. And the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all in one accord in one place, and these were particularly the apostles. Okay, this was 50 days after Jesus was pr crucified, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of the rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Um... Okay, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, as it set upon each of them. Okay, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and now this is where the Pentecostal gets, this is the only way you can really be saved. Because they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay, we're not filled if we're not praying in tongues. And began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave the, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Um, and there was no, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, Jews, these were Jews. These weren't Gentiles. Devout men out of every nation in heaven. This is in a Jewish context. Why is it? Because the purpose of this was a sign. Okay? Um, and, um, okay, so we go back. 1 Corinthians one twenty two. 1 Corinthians, and you don't have to turn all here. I'm just going to hit these. 1 Corinthians one twenty two. First uh, Corinthians one twenty two says, "For the Jews require sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom." Huh? Okay. Matthew sixteen four. Matthew sixteen four. Matthew sixteen four says, "A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after sign." Okay, we already said that. Okay. Um, these are just some verses to think about. Matthew twelve thirty eight. Matthew twelve thirty eight. Um, twelve thirty eight. Okay, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we, we would a sign of thee. We, know we, we want a sign. But he answered unto them, and he said again, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And we already quoted that. Now, how does this apply to today? Because all the charismatics are out there seeking a sign and a wonder. Aren't the Catholics doing the same thing? Oh, I saw an apparition of Mary, the mother of Medjugorje, the, the mother of Guadalupe. Oh, all this and that. It's all devils. It is all devils. And they're not seeing it. They think that they do God's service. And they don't do God's service. So I'm wrap this up. If therefore the whole church be come together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, 
Will they not say that we are mad? Uh, wouldn't that be what happened? You go into a church and they all come in there all speaking in tongues and say, you're nuts. Uh, but if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not, or one is unlearned, he is convinced of all that he is judged of all. In other words, that guy would come in and understand what they're saying. It'd be like hard preaching. Oh wow, I'm oh, boy, I am in a sinful state and I do need a savior. They're not gonna they're not gonna get convicted of that unless they understood the tongue. And most of the time they're not gonna understand that. So it says, Let all things be done unto edifying. So that's just a context. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at most by three. And by that course, and let one interpret. So you could have two or three people speak. Now, what normally happens at these Pentecostal things? You've got maybe hundreds of people speaking in tongues. Okay, everybody speak in tongues. And then you've got more than one person interpreting. So they're not even, even if, they, even if it was biblical what they're doing, they're not doing it right. That's what I noticed a lot. That's what I went to the pastor of my church. I said, even if tongues were biblical, we're not following it by the Bible. Well, they threw the Bible out a long time ago. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. So you weren't supposed to even do that unless there was an interpreter. Why? Because then there was no way to edify the body. Seems reasonable. And let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. Um, if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let him first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that ye all may learn, and all may be comforted. Um, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion. And this is another thing I bring up about tongues. You're telling me, you're doing, you're speaking tongues, you're doing it totally unbiblically in the church, and it's this big mishmash of confusion. You all got different Bibles, you don't even know what Bible. God is not the author of confusion, period. Okay? But of peace, as in the churches of all saints. Let your woman keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Now, I would think this would also fall under the context of tongues in the church. Because it says, let not your woman. Why does it say, let not your women? Because I'm telling you, I think the reason is, you notice that they did this study on the five black women that were Pentecostal? I didn't see near the problem of uncontrollable speaking in tongues with the men as I did the women. Why? Because the women are more easily deceived. And I'm not saying that because I'm prejudiced, I'm a male chauvinist. I'm saying the Bible talks about it in, in, in the very, very first part of Genesis, where it says Adam, or Adam really wasn't the one that was deceived. Eve was the one that was deceived. He was the one that was beguiled. She was the one that was beguiled. So, who would the devil target? He would target the women. We're all created differently. That's why a woman in a biblical sense, to have a male covering over them. But the problem is, is the men anymore don't have any backbones. They don't care about the Bible. So the women rule over the men. They're pathetic. And they deserve whatever they get. And they don't have any backbone. Oh, I'm not going to stand up to my wife if she wants a Christmas tree. Or, um, you know, if she wants to pray in tongues. I, I, I don't... Uh, she might get mad at me. I might have to sleep on the couch. It's pathetic. Yeah, it's gone. I want everybody to hear it. We were talking about the biblical context of speaking in tongues and that it has to be done in a decent scene and order, which is anything that you're going to see in a Pentecostal church. It's going to be out of control, which right there you know it's not of God. And there's certain parameters that we're going over here about this. And do you realize that in witchcraft, one of the main things that they do is speak in tongues? See, they've been doing this for hundreds and thousands before... The biblical tongues were ever around. The witches have been doing this. So here's what happens. And I've read books that were former witches that became Christians that they would say the easiest churches ever to infiltrate were Pentecostal churches. Because we could go in there and we could do our tongues business and we, we'd be cursing the thing. Everybody would be speaking in tongues. We'd be doing our tongues. We'd be cursing the congregation, releasing devils on them, and they would never know anything. Do you see how easy it is to infiltrate a charismatic church? Now, just from that one thing alone you would want to be very, very, very careful about it. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Kevin. Um, so, we were, we were here, uh, verse 34, uh, but I wanted to also, I'm just going to flip back here real quick. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought. In other words, we don't always know what, what we need to pray. But the Spirit, now this is capital S, 
Holy Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. Intercession is like a, an intense prayer. Intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is actually within us and, the, and that Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God or ever, to ever make intercession for the saints. Okay? Um, the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So this cannot be in, in regard to tongues. Okay? It says cannot be uttered. Tongues are uttered. Okay? And he that searcheth the hearts and knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the, so the Holy Spirit knows how to get a hold of God. Um, Hebrews 7.25 says, um, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that cometh unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Okay, speaking of Jesus Christ. Now, Christ also, there's three part, Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son. So Christ ever maketh intercession for the saints. And the Holy Spirit, which lives inside a believer, making us the temple of God, also make us intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So these are just a couple points, just interesting points. If you go back to verse 34 in um, 1 Corinthians 14, it says, Let your woman keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Now, you got to understand, too, this was to Corinthians, the Corinthian church. This was a very, very worldly, unruly church. Okay? But they are commanded to be under obedience, also saith the Lord. The context is tongues in an unruly church. If the Pentecostal women of today were uh, governed by this, they would have to keep their mouth shut. Yet, they're the ones that are out there doing this. They're the ones out there really propagating the tongues thing. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Well, what are they going to do now? Let them ask their, let them ask their jello backbone husbands? Like they're like they're gonna like they're gonna pay attention like their husbands are in the Word of God trying to search this stuff out anyway. <sighs> Give me a break. Be better off going to you know ask your garbage men. So let let them ask their husbands at home for it is a shameful woman to speak in the church. Now I shouldn't say that about everybody. Make this blanket statement, but I'm talking about in general. The husbands aren't doing any more than the women are. It's just this big experience. It's a big social club. Um. So that's basically what I wanted to come, you know, cover for today. Um, we'll go ahead and end there. And yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it's it's this has been a good time of looking at um, the uh, apparent apostasy going on in the church. We covered a lot of those bases today. Uh, I'll go ahead and close this out in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that you've given us. And Lord, I do pray that that these words that have been spoken today, God, they do not return void. I pray, God, that, that we would, in this room and anyone listening to these recordings, would walk in truth, God. And if I've said anything, Lord God, that's not truth, I pray, God, you would correct me. And I pray, Lord God, humble myself before you and and Lord, I pray that you would forgive us for any and all sins that we've committed in any way, shape, and form, God, that we would come before you clean, that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, that you would use us, God, and use the true body of Christ, that your name would be glorified through us, and that, Lord God, you would use us to lead many people to the Lord, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit and your angelic host, God, through the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I pray, Lord God, that you would even deal with your enemies this day, and the fear of God would be upon the sin-sick world, God, that you would bring us back according to the next appointed time. And that, Lord God, that you would give us a vision of what you would have us do with our lives, and what, what decisions you would have us make. Because you said in your word, without a vision, the people perish. And I pray, God, that we would just be obedient, Lord God, and, and submissive to your, to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that, Lord God, we would stay near you all the days of our life. Lord God, that you would save our unsaved family members, Lord God, for it's your will that not one would perish, but that all would come to repentance. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.